off of there that might be helpful for you. Um, but maybe you want to learn a little bit more about what the application process looks like, some of the details of the program. So we're going to be sharing all of that as we go through. Right now, the, the kind of the focus we'll talk about is for those of you who might be considering applying uh, for our upcoming uh, new class of students who would be starting uh, in the summer of 2023. So more specifically, and we'll kind of share the timeline with you here in a bit, but we really uh, get started about uh, middle of June, uh, at which for us is considered our second summer session, uh, and that's when we, we kick things off. And so uh, as we go through a bit of the information tonight, I just want you to kind of keep that in mind uh, as we, we talk about what that timeline is going to look like. We'll be talking about, you know, just, just a few months from now. Uh, but we'll provide that overview of the program. We're also going to talk about um, uh, what's uh, provided for those of you who are K-12. Uh, an option that is available is ultimately uh, uh, being able to complete the requirements for what's known as the superintendent's license. Um, uh, and uh, for our K-12 folks, uh, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, another pathway that's there that maybe you're not familiar with. Uh, while we have our three year EDD program, we also have uh, an EDS to EDD program, an educational specialist to the doctorate in education. And so I'll be speaking about that, some of that as well. So first, our, our vision for the program, right? So uh, a few years ago, uh, we decided that uh, instead of being like other traditional EDD programs, we wanted to have a bit of a shift where we wanted to focus on, uh, and you'll hear me talk about this quite a bit, a problem of practice model. And uh, with that, a dissertation and practice model. And all of you have heard about your dissertation. And, you know, sometimes folks get really anxious when they hear about a dissertation. It seems so daunting, right? Well, the dissertation and practice is quite a bit different because with the dissertation and practice, we want you to explore a problem in your workplace, right? In the school setting where you work. Uh, school, community college, university, whatever that may be, we want you to identify that problem and then come up with a potential solution based on what you read in the literature and what works specifically for your site. And so um, it's uh, it's a different sort of model, and that's kind of led us to be able to say, all right, we, we really want, as part of our vision, and many of you are familiar with uh, the ECU motto, uh, Surveyor's Service, we really want to exemplify that service piece, right? Before, uh, for instance, I came through the EDD program <clears throat> a few years ago, quite a few years ago. And when I came through that program, the dissertation ends up sitting on a bookshelf over here, right? I did all this work and it's a really pretty book that I have back here that no one ever reads, right? It doesn't really do much. It hasn't really served the people that I want to serve, the students that I wanted to help, the institutions I wanted to help. And so, to take that next step, we were like, you know what, we're, we're really passionate about service to our region and service to our state. And so we want to empower our students and equip them with the tools they need to go out and make change. So we want you to lead, serve and transform in these really ever changing complex environments where we work. And so that is the heart of what the vision is for, for our particular program. Uh, you'll notice in our mission that we, we talk about respecting diversity right? Building trustful relationships, applying scholarship to practice, uh, engaging in purposeful collaboration. So when we talk about those things, we really mean that that needs to be embedded in our coursework and our dissertation work. Um, and so as you're taking classes along the way, as you're working on your dissertation, uh, we expect you to be focusing that effort, uh, that improvement in your workplace on an issue that addresses educational equity and or social justice, right? How can I create a more equitable environment for all students, uh, all coworkers, those people that are stakeholders, right? In your workplace, that's what we want. And so part of that uh, is, is built into our mission, building the trustful relationships, you know, collaborating. What you'll find in our dissertation work and all of our coursework is we want you communicating with you know, colleagues in your workplace, maybe reaching across divisions, across departments, central offices, other areas, so that you can learn and grow through the coursework, through some of the assignments, through the dissertation and practice. 
And because we're educational leadership, we want you to lead, right? We want you to get practice leading an effort to address a problem of practice, a real life problem that you're you're seeing in your school, your university, your community college uh, that's relevant to issues of equity. So we need to see that leadership. It's a chance for you to practice it. We kind of hold our students hand through that process. Um, but it's also there's a sense of familiarity because it's in your workplace. And I'll be touching a bit more on, on uh, the problem of practice as we go. So uh, and you know, Christy and Joel are familiar with with our term. We, we call them scholarly practitioners, right? So uh, we think of our model a little differently than a traditional PhD program. So if you've done your homework and you're like, oh, should I get an EDD or a PhD? What's the difference? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But in our EDD programs, we refer to our students as scholarly practitioners, right? We're not preparing you to go and be a university professor or researcher. We're preparing you to be a leader practitioner who applies scholarship, right? Uh, you're going to learn how to read scholarship, apply it in practice, uh, and uh, uh, become servant leaders, civic leaders, you know, professional practitioners, global leaders. We expect all of that to come together with our students. And so when you leave our program, we want someone who can go identify a problem in practice, come up with solutions based on what the literature says, lead efforts to tackle that problem, uh, and collect data and analyze it to be able to determine whether or not it's making a difference. Dr. Lewis, I would add really quickly, that doesn't mean that you don't or can't down the line become a professor um, or you know an instructor somewhere. Um, uh, Dr. Lewis and I both started as practitioners and had many years of being a practitioner before we jumped into the um, instruction world. So, so that, you know, that is an option down the line, but we love that we get to help you get more experience and become better administrators before, before you do that. Yeah. Just don't come take our jobs, right? Then we're good. Yeah. You can be our colleagues, right? Yeah. So when we look at, uh, you know, a PhD program versus an EDD program, and I remember when I was first kind of considering even going back to get my doctor and trying to figure out the distinction. You know, a PhD program, you know, over here on the left, we're looking at, you know, a researcher, right? They're trying to identify where's a gap in the literature? What's something we don't really know much about, we don't really understand? And they want to try and fill that gap, uh, that gap and contribute to kind of the, the theory that's around that particular issue. Whereas for us, it's more about addressing a problem or sometimes we call it a focus of practice. Uh, if we're wanting to avoid that deficit language, we'll move away from problem of practice to a focus of practice. Um, but we also want to provide that that information to our stakeholders to help them make decisions. So being able to go out, gather the literature, right, identify the problem, share that information with our stakeholders to help them decide as you're leading this effort to move forward, how can we make things better? Getting their buy in. So the audience for most researchers, like I said, it's going to sit on a bookshelf for researchers and academics. Whereas for a scholarly practitioner, we want you to be able to go back and share what you've learned and what you're trying to address to stakeholders, employees, students, um, you know, the, the people who uh, day in, day out, you're coming in contact with. Now the methodology, all right, so how, what's our approach for doing this? How do we go about doing it? So the researcher is gonna look at, you know, these casual relationships and in-depth uh, study of the subject matter. Whereas for us, we wanted to look at the impact, right? And a lot of times this is interdisciplinary, but what's the impact of this effort? We're gonna try a new approach to address this problem. Let me see how much of a difference it's making or not making. Now, who sets the agenda? The researcher does, because uh, they're basically choosing their own path there. For us, it's you in conjunction with your stakeholders, right? This isn't you just saying, here's where we're going, we're doing this, follow me or else. This is how can we get there together, right? We really want to build leaders. And generalizability, right? So the researcher is trying to say, all right, whatever I find, how generalizable is it broadly, right? Where, what other places can I apply this? Whereas the scholarly practitioner, your site is different from any other person's site. 
So what works for Joel, for instance, may not work for one of his classmates at another school. It might be in the very same district. What works for Christy at her institution is going to look very different than might work what works at another institution. Right, so a PhD uh, and the research that they do doesn't necessarily take into account the context, the population that's specific to that site. You know the culture of where you work, right? You know the people where you work. You know what they're going to be receptive to, what they're not, and how to lead them. So ultimately, the result, PhD versus the EDD. Now, if you've explored our website a bit, you know that we're members of what's called the Carnegie Project on the Education Doctor, or CPED. So this was an initiative that started in 2007, uh, really to advance the EDD programs. And the EDD at that point was trying to decide, OK, are we going to be like a PhD program, or are we going to go on a different path here where we're trying to build leaders uh, to address the problems in practice? And so there's more than 110 colleges and universities that are members, we're among them. Uh, and we were actually, was it 2020, Dr. Puckett? We were a runner up for program of the year for uh, the nation. 20, uh, it might've been 21 actually, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We're just that good that long. That's all, you know, we can't even keep up with the year. So uh, for our programs, when we're looking at that, uh, the CPEB model, um, they are uh, a wonderful resource to us because it allows us to collaborate with other uh, colleagues, other students who will be able to communicate with other students across institutions. We have uh, different CPED events that we attend um, annually where we're able to go and, and learn about just what other institutions are doing that are part of the CPED program. Uh, and Dr. Puckett, myself and our colleagues uh, frequently go there and share some of our best practices, bring practices from other places back to our institution so that we don't want, you know, to say, OK, just because we're saying that this isn't generalizable, it's just specific for your institution or just for Eastern North Carolina. We want to learn about best practices uh, nationally and internationally and bring those back to you. So the, the CPED influence kind of to be a member of CPED, you have to pursue this dissertation and practice model. Right. So again, not the dissertation that sits on the shelf, but what's happening in your workplace and also the questions that you're trying to address need to be framed around equity, ethics, social justice. Right. We want to solve those problems in our workplace uh, that are evident that we're able to collect data on and show that these are real issues that we're dealing with. So some of the highlights, we have two concentrations. So there's some of you may be interested in our higher education concentration. Uh, you work in a community college, university setting, um, and then there's our K-12 concentration for our folks who maybe are school leaders, administrators, district leaders, district administrators, or maybe even you work at the state level. Our program is 60 semester hours beyond the master's degree. Uh, now we can potentially say if you got started somewhere else and realize what a huge mistake you made, you need to go to ECU, right? Uh, some of those credits could be transferable. We have to get that approved through uh, through our graduate school, but uh, often it's nine, twelve hours that uh, on the on the high end that we might be able to transfer in. Um, we try to have our students be able to complete the program in a three year time frame, and that includes the dissertation. Now that's very ambitious. Joel and Christy, would you say that's very ambitious? Yeah. But they're on the they're on the backside, right? They've uh, defended their proposal, and so now they can kind of catch their breath, uh, and and we can explain more about what that looks like when they get a chance to to kind of address all of you. But uh, three years, it's a lot, and the first year is really intensive. So, given that, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about for the K-12 folks. It's particularly intensive for them because of the licensure piece. And so I want to talk about another option that's available to you where maybe it just meets your needs personally uh, better. And so I'll walk through that in a bit. Our completion rate is around 85%. So we're getting students through our program. Uh, we are not out to fail you, right? We want you to be successful. The folks that we lose, and, and Joel and Christy will be able to test to this, the folks that we lose, you know, it's other stuff that gets in the way. A lot of times it's life, it's job changes, it's personal things that come up that um, 
can just really derail you. And we understand, right? We try to work with, and Christy and Joel can speak, I, I know I won't speak for either of you here, but they both had just really trying personal circumstances that they have both managed to persevere through. Um, and so that may not work for everyone. But we want to make sure that you're in good standing. If you need whatever you need, we're there to support you because we also understand, um, you know, that maybe right now isn't the right time for you. Uh, maybe another time is, but if you can persevere, push through, we're going to have your back. Um, and we mentioned dissertation support that's embedded in the program. So one of the things that's different from uh, many other programs is literally on the first day that you come in and uh, you meet with Dr. Puckett and myself, we're going to start talking about the dissertation right away. Like usually um, uh, very, in, very, very much immediately we start identifying. All right, what do you want to dig into for your dissertation? Part of the reason why is three years. That's quick. Like we've got a lot to do in a very short amount of time. And so we want to go ahead and start thinking through what you might want to pursue. What's a particular potential problem in your workplace that you could tackle for your dissertation? Um, and, you know, that degree uh, culmination is ultimately this defense of the dissertation. Maybe you've heard of that and people are so nervous about the dissertation defense. And um, now Joel and Christy haven't had the full dissertation defense yet, but they've had the, the proposal defense. And just really quickly, Christy, Joel, how how was that? Was that the intimidating, scary event that you thought it was going to be? No. The morning of, now if you would ask me the morning of, as I was texting Dr. Pocket, like, I'm going to throw up, I don't think I can do this. Yes, but but once I went, I'm like, wow, you got all worked up over nothing because your chair is going to have your back and make sure you're ready for that defense moment. Yeah, and, and they, don't, they don't allow you to get into it unless you're you're ready for it. So it's not like you're going into it and you're like halfway done. Like you've been prepared for it. So once that, it, it almost becomes a conversation because you done worked on this stuff like all the time for like so many hours and days and weeks. And so it, it pretty much is second nature to you once you get to that point. Thank you both. No, that's it. And and Joel's points well taken. Like it's a conversation, right? This is a chance when we we pull together your committee for your dissertation, and you're going to help us identify who's going to be on that committee and give feedback. Um, I learn as much from you all as you're going to learn from me, right? And the Dr. Puckett would say the same. Our faculty would say the same. You know your site better than anyone else. You know the problems in your world better than anyone else. Part of what we bring to the table. Right, so you bring the practitioner perspective. We bring our previous experience as practitioners, but here are the tools. Here's the scholarship. Here's the methodology for research that you can bring in and apply to your workplace. So we bring some things to the table. You bring some things to the table and together we want to help you uh, solve all the problems in your workplace, right? We want to just help make your place that you work, the students you serve, the coworkers that you have. Uh, uh, better off for you having gone through this program. So our structure, we have a hybrid course structure um, and uh, the. When we say hybrid, so for us, distance education at ECU is 80% or more online. Um, and uh, frankly, for most of our courses, uh, we're closer to 100% online. That being said, Dr. Puckett and I, the very first semester, we want you to bond with your classmates, your cohort. And I think, you know, Joel and Christy will attest to this. You become very close to those folks. They help see you through. That's your network. Those are your friends. They are, uh, I like to refer to them as uh, your critical friends, right? Like they've got your back, but they're going to tell you you got something stuck in your teeth, right? We all need those kind of friends. So those are what your, your, your cohort mates are going to be. And so we have this cohort model. And at the very beginning, uh, this summer uh, that's mentioned is uh, June, mid June to mid July, uh, we'll have you come to campus um, for three non consecutive weekends. So we kind of alternate uh, so you can spend time getting to know your cohort. We have some activities to help you kind of bond. You kind of start identifying what your problem of practice is going to be for your dissertation. 
Uh, and we're very intentional about making those connections early. Uh, when I came through my program, I would not have finished without the support of my cohort because, again, we're all adults. Life is happening fast. Um, and for me, it was, you know, the death of my father, you know, my own like illness, all those things that kind of come up. And you think, all right, I just I can't. This is one of the things I got to drop. And that's when your cohort steps in and say, no, we're going to help carry you through this tough batch. We're going to get you through your faculty. are going to step in and do that same thing. And so we feel like the cohort model is critical to that 85 percent completion rate that we we mentioned. Uh, I feel like we do a great job, but it's your classmates who do a phenomenal job of helping get you through. So we have that opportunity to kind of get to know everyone so that later when you're in these online classes and you're on a screen like this, it's not a bunch of strangers, right? But these are people that um, uh, that you get to know, you feel comfortable talking with. Um, and then along the way, we're intentional also about having events every so often that are going to bring you together again. Uh, so we have, um, you know, um, and you understand this as you kind of move forward, but we have what's called a poster gallery walk. Um, we have just a set of events along the way that's going to have you come back together in person uh, when possible. So we use um, for our online coursework, it's synchronous, so you would be live face to face for a lot of that. Uh, we use the Canvas uh, learning management platform. Uh, and then when we talk about the, the other 20% face to face, on the high end, that would be four to five meetings per semester. Now, when we do meet, we like to meet off site. We like to meet where you are. And so we actually have students a lot of times that'll host us when they want to do so, right? If it's more convenient for you and your cohort, you all say, you know what, most of us, it's just too far to travel, whatever it may be, we can do online. Um, but inevitably, folks like to get together and see one another and get away a bit, right? So we leave it up to you and your cohort to determine, all right, are we going to take advantage of those four to five face-to-face -face class meetings? Do we want those online? But if we do have them, you know, where are they going to be? And so we've had locations, Snow Hill, Tarboro, Rocky Mount, Kinston, Wilson. Um, just a couple weekends ago, um, uh, a class that I typically have online, they all said, look, we really want to, we want to get together. Can we do that? And I said, sure, let's find a date that works for everyone. We identified, a, uh, it was a Saturday, and we looked at on the map, we're like, all right, where's convenient, most convenient for everyone? What's a central location? And we ended up identifying uh, just outside of Raleigh in the Clayton area. And so uh, we have a graduate who graciously agreed to host us. We met at his, uh, his elementary school. We all brought refreshments and snacks, more food than I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, everyone just brought whatever they could. Some of it I think was illegal. I'm not sure. But anyway, it was a great day. We had a great time. And uh, it was a chance for us to, to be together, to bond as a cohort, but also to make tremendous advancement in some of our work on our problem practice. So uh, you all, as already many of your education leaders, you know, this is a chance where we kind of empower you about what kind of program do you want? Now, most of our courses meet in the evenings, but again, like I said, if, if everyone gets together and they say, we, we want to do a Saturday, all right, we'll do a Saturday. Um, but otherwise, we work with your cohorts. What works for most of you is a particular evening during the week, 5.30 to 8.30. And uh, we also have this optional international experience, and Christy's uh, very excited about um, our, our Spain option. Joel, unfortunately, has to sit back, right? And he's He's got to stay at his school, but Dr. Puckett uh, and our, our chair, uh, Dr. Ringler, uh, lead our international experience. Uh, and not always, but um, uh, we try to focus on uh, a location in South America. Now, this, what, how many weeks away is it? What is it, two weeks away, three weeks away? So Dr. Puckett's going to be going to Spain, Toledo, Spain, in a couple of weeks. Uh, with uh, how many how many students, Dr. Puckett? Ten, or do you have eleven fingers? It may be eleven. I couldn't tell. You yeah, got to, All right, so so it was ten, <laughs> and uh, so with ten of our students and Dr. Puckett, you mind sharing a bit about our our optional? It's optional, but it's really economical considering the cost of going to Spain in this instance. 
Yeah. So in, in 2019, we actually went to Peru. So we took a group of students to Peru. Um, the, the trip is typically around 12 days. Um, so less than two weeks. We plan it over, you know, like two weekends. So that way you're missing um, as little during the week as possible. Um, that's one of the things that's great about this because I I love that we get to offer you this because I never got to study abroad. So the opportunity to be able to study abroad as a doctoral student with lives and jobs and families and all those things going on and still be able to do this is really exciting. So um, but it's it's still the three hour class. So Christy is traveling to Spain with us. Um, Joel is taking the same class, but his class meets in obviously here or online, I guess. But um, but it's still the same content, still the same information. We are still covering the same kinds of topics. Um, so same class, just we will the one that is going to go to Spain will actually compare um, sort of politics and power in schools and and universities and and colleges in Spain versus what's in specifically North Carolina. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at as far as when why we do this. Um, we try to go to rural communities specifically because we're looking for um, areas that are similar to what we experience. Um, a lot of us work in rural areas or, you know, have you know, or have worked in rural areas and and understand what that's about. So so that's sort of what we're looking for when we select the location. Um, this actually takes place during this the spring of your second your second year. So um, like Dr. Lewis said, um, you know, Christy and Joel are finishing up their second year. So this would be the, the point in time where they would get to do the international travel. Um, like I said, we went to Peru. In 2019, unfortunately, COVID has sort of grounded us until until now. Um, but when we went to Peru, we visited a private university, a public university, um, a K-12, two K-12 schools, and then we did a um, a public service sort of activity where we went and spent all day with this group of um, children in aftercare, um, after school care, um, which. I mean, I've been in education for quite a while, and I would say that that was the most um, impactful thing that I've ever done in my career was to get to go and work with these kids and and spend time with them. Um, none of them spoke any English. None of us spoke any Spanish, but we spent all day coloring and doing homework and playing games. And I'm sure they made up the rules to those games as we went, because I remember Uno being very different from that the way they played it. But um, I learned colors in Spanish. They thought that was very important. Um, but we we did have a good time. We were able to take school supplies and you know things to the to the students or to the kids, and and it was just a great time. So. Spain coming up. We did. Um, I did hear today that we're going to be visiting um, two colleges and two K-12 schools, and then we're going to be working with um, an organization that works in the community with the homeless population, um, providing different um, services for them. So we'll do that while we're there as well. This next year's group, the group that is just finishing their first year, um, our intention for them and what the plan is actually is for them to go to Argentina next year. So we'll be going and studying um, for 12 days or so in uh, Patagonia in Argentina. So, and we try to give the students the opportunity to sort of vote on where you're most interested in going. Um, like Dr. Lewis said, we try to keep to South America. Um, with COVID, it was recommended that we do a Europe this year rather than a South America, maybe. Who knows? Um, <laughs> with COVID, it jumps all around, right? But um, but we will be back, um, we think, in, in South America next year. Um, and then maybe looking, you know, somewhere else in, in South America for the following year. Um, and our chair, Dr. Ringler, goes with us, and Dr. Ringler's originally from Colombia. So, you know, we go to these Spanish speaking locations and we have somebody with us who's a native Spanish speaker, which is really, really helpful for us, um, for any of us that are not, not Spanish speakers. So, but again, it's just another thing that I think that's sort of unique to our program that we're able to offer that that maybe there are some programs that don't have this opportunity. Um, the price of 
the travel and everything is built into the tuition for this particular class. And then the department also offers a stipend to each student to help cover some of the travel costs. So like Dr. Lewis said, it's it's really reasonable when you're looking at it as I'm getting three hours of credit towards my degree, but then I'm also getting this travel experience at the same time. So just something sort of to think about going forwards and thinking about maybe if if you're if you're admitted, what what your choice would want to be. Thank you, Dr. Puckett. Um, I'm holding out to join them whenever we go to uh, somewhere in the Caribbean. We'll see if that happens anytime soon. Uh, so uh, for our tuition and fees, right? So the bottom dollar, what we're thinking about. So. Part of why we aren't meeting on campus uh, so much, you know, we mentioned uh, for the most part, we'll either be meeting online or in some of your locations uh, is our courses are classified as distance education. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but all of us, since we went to education, apparently we didn't do it for the money. Um, I know that's shocking, right? Uh, but because we didn't do it for the money, uh, Otherwise, it would be just terribly expensive uh, for, and, and many of us you know, loans, and it would just take a toll to be able to pursue uh, a degree like this. So instead, it's at the distance education rate, which is about a third of what normal tuition rate would be. Um, and so we're talking about for our courses, you know, $290 credit hour, about $870 per class, and that includes our fees. And so, all right, well, what does that look like? Well, if you're taking two classes a semester on average with us, following our program of study, then you're talking about uh, 1740 a semester. And so over those 60 hours, you're talking about $17,000 for uh, that degree versus what otherwise would be something where we're, we're talking much closer to 50,000. Now, 17,000 is still a lot of money. We understand that. Um, and so, uh, once students are usually into year two, there's scholarships that do become available and they can apply for. And so we've got some students who uh, every year are fortunate to receive uh, some of those, but it's still a lot of money. We get that. And so uh, part of what, hopefully as you're doing your research, you'll see the distinction between how much um, someone who has that EDD in hand is gonna be able to make uh, in their career and the opportunities that come about versus someone who does not have that degree in their hand. My uh, chair for my dissertation, my advisor, when I was coming through, he used to say it was the, the EDD was the key to the executive washroom. And he said there was gonna be options that came available, things that I never anticipated. And he was very true. I've held positions over the years since getting that EDD that weren't even on my radar. And so, uh, and, and many of them made it more than worth, uh, uh, worth the cost up front. So our curriculum, what does that look like? So we have uh, seven courses or 21 hours that are kind of core content courses. Then we have uh, what we like to call our research courses our, or uh, more so our design courses. Those are the ones that are going to, our core content, You know, what are the things that we feel like you need to know, that background information that you need to know in order to be successful in your field. The research courses, those design courses, those are the ones that Hey, how, how am I going to conduct research, right? How am I going to plan this problem apart? How am I going to carry this out? So instead of it being an add-on, we build it into your courses. Because again, part of the instruction is uh, teaching you how to identify a problem, how you're going to gather the literature around that problem, how you're going to lead change. So that isn't something separate that's really embedded in our coursework. Uh, and sorry, I went back one too many. There we go. Um, we have two courses that just kind of finish up uh, the dissertation work. And so that's what Joel and Christy will be doing next year. They'll be taking uh, one of those each semester to kind of finish up their dissertation work. And then we have our concentration courses. So 18 hours like K-12, higher ed, you know, internship courses, those sorts of things that are built into the program for our 60 total. Now, these numbers here are going to mean anything to any of you, but we want you to just get a feel for, all right, I'm going to be taking every semester roughly two classes, 
right? So for our K-12 folks starting this summer, you would take the same two classes that our higher ed folks take. You take those together, actually, higher ed and K-12. And then you kind of break up into your concentration, right? So there'll be a few distinctions as we go. But basically, you can count on two classes a semester. The exception being, uh, if you're bringing in transfer credit, uh, if you're K-12 and you already have your EDS, the education specialist, uh, that would change this quite a bit. The other thing is, uh, during a couple of summers, you would only have one course. But this is how we're able to get folks in and out through in three years. This is the course of study. Now, sometimes folks fall behind, right? And so we work with them and we have some exit ramps and on ramps for them as life happens and uh, uh, to be able to jump in, jump out, but you do lose track of that cohort, right? So then we've got to work to kind of build you in with another cohort. Uh, so that's basically what this looks like. If you want to learn more about uh, specific courses, uh, what each one uh, kind of stands for here with the, the numbering system we have, when you would take those, you can go to our website and you'll be able to pull that information up. So uh, I mentioned, you know, the, the K-12 degree. So applicants uh, are able to, as you go through the program, not only are you working on your dissertation and practice, but uh, we expect that our K-12 folks, in order to be eligible for this superintendent's license, uh, you need to have a current North Carolina administration or supervision license. So in all the likelihood, you went through an MSA program, a master in school administration program, if you're K-12. Uh, and that's the only way that you would be eligible for the superintendent's license. Part of that coursework that you're taking in your concentration, you're doing what's called DSLPs, district level service leadership projects, right? These are challenging. Joel, would you agree that these are these are pretty, pretty challenging? Yes, along with what you're doing for your dissertation, it can be very um, and it, it kind of starts to just intertwine. Yeah, yeah. And so if you're able to weave it together with your dissertation work, it makes a lot of sense. There's times where you just you just can't. Um, and so you've got these projects that as you complete them and there's a template we follow and students kind of pull information together and these service leadership projects, they're working usually with district level issues, right? Gathering information about what their you know, finance or HR, whatever area it may be to kind of just dig a little more in depth in in some of these like problems in the workplace. Um, but those DSLPs are what count towards your portfolio for the superintendent's license. So we compile your DSLP work as you go. And then when you uh, graduate, we submit that on your behalf to the state. Uh, and that's how you're awarded the North Carolina superintendent's license. So I mentioned before that for, and this is for our K-12 folks as it relates to that license piece, there is another path. And um, what I would say to you is that choosing this path really depends on what's best for you and your family and where you're at at this point. So we have what's called the EDS to EDD pathway. Now you can jump in like Joel did, right? And say, you know what? I wanna work on this, try and get it done in three years. Um, and uh, it can be just very challenging because unlike for our higher ed folks, we've got those DSLPs, right? We have to complete that in order for you to be eligible for the license. Or you can separate the two where you work on the DSLPs and the license for a couple years and then move into the EDD. And so that's what our EDS to EDD pathway is. So uh, you would apply for what's called our education specialist program you would get 36 it's a 36 hour program 27 of which counts towards the edd so basically you would knock out half of uh, the coursework for your edd now what's nice about that is let's say that you know whether it's you know, family kids health parents i mean there's so many things going on job changes all these things that come up Let's say you get a couple years in and then life starts to happen. You're not just going to walk away at that point with nothing in hand. You would have the license in hand so that you're then eligible to go be a superintendent, for instance. Or you would be able to continue on, apply to the EDD. We would then uh, have that record of, hey, 
you were able to pull off the EDS, you would jump in and instead of two courses, going back, instead of two courses per semester, you would be taking one course per semester, which, uh, Joe, what kind of a difference would that make in your life if you were doing uh, just your dissertation work right now instead of DSOPs and dissertation? So oh, that, um, and especially, at, you know, at the K-12, you just have so much um, demands, uh, budget, uh, just everything coming in. And so then just to have one thing to concentrate on would be so much more, uh, it would be so beneficial. Because like Dr. Lewis said, like sometimes you'll do a DSLP and it weaves perfectly with your dissertation. So that one's easy. But then there's another one that has nothing to do with what you're studying. And so you have to try to juggle the two and you're typing papers and it, it gets a little messy, especially towards crunch time. And if you're a procrastinator, uh, you know, you're going to be drinking a lot of coffee, a lot of five hour energy and all that good stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yeah. And so now, all right, there's pros and cons to this, right? So Joe was mentioned some of the pros. I was mentioned some of the pros that, you know, all right, I could I could take this three year degree and basically stretch it out to, to a five year degree. Well, five years, it's a long time. Folks don't necessarily want to take five years to get there. We understand that. So that's why we have the three year EDD option. But again, it's very intensive. If, um, for instance, when I was going through this program, this that wasn't an option. But, you know, I had young kids, I had the health issues, as I mentioned before, you know, family loss, all these things. And, oh, I'm having to, to complete, you know, these DSLPs, I'm having to work on the district. It was a lot. It's an awful lot and do a great job with the day job. So that's where for our K-12 folks, kind of thinking through what's best for me at this point. Do I have the, the, the time and the intensity to be able to say, I'm going to go all in three years and knock this out? Or, you know what, I need to pace myself a little bit more, stretch this out over five years, work on the license first, get that content down, and then shift and just immerse myself in the dissertation solely. So it's a great option to have rather than you being locked into just one particular path. If this is something that you're interested in, let's say you've already applied for the EDD and you're like, wait a minute, that EDS doesn't sound so bad. Maybe I want to pace myself that way. Um, you would just reach out to Dr. Puck and we'd be able to kind of work with you at that point to shift your application from the EDD to the EDS. Dr. Puck, anything I missed about the uh, EDS to EDD pathway? No, I think you got everything. I would just say to, um, like you said, you know, really evaluate what your what your family life looks like, what your work life looks like people absolutely do it in three years. So don't let us scare you away from, from doing it in three years because it, it I mean, a, we have 85% plus um, success rate, but you just have to really sort of evaluate what's gonna work for you, um, what's gonna be successful, how you're gonna be successful, and keeping in mind that you don't always know what's coming up. You know, you don't know when you're gonna be offered that, that great job change. Um, and you're going to move or you don't know when you may have an illness or, you know, something happened in your family. So um, just sort of keeping that in mind and making sure that that you know you and that you can plan for things like that. But it's definitely doable. Um, one of the things that makes it doable is the cohort because your cohort's going to hold your hand. They're going to be the ones that are texting you saying, did you get this done? Do you need your do you need some help? What can I do for you? You know. Um, they, the, the cohort, they, the folks in the cohorts take care of each other, so. And so I wanted to take a minute just to see if, uh, if uh, Joel and Christy would mind just uh, sharing just for a couple minutes, a little bit about their experiences and any information that they feel might be helpful to you as they reflect on what it was like when they were in the exact same space you are right now, trying to decide, is this something I should pursue? Should I not? What would it look like? Why ECU? And so um, I want to open it up to both of you. Uh, we'll be gentlemen, which was, Joel. Which right? was two we'll, years ago at this we'll, point, we'll, my friends, two years right. ago. And they'll this time next year, they'll be wrapping up their dissertation uh, defense and purchasing uh, graduation regalia, all that good stuff. And so we're going to be gentlemen, Joel, and let Christy go first, if that's OK. Christy? Fantastic. Um, yeah, well, actually, Dr. Puckett, I have to say, seeing that chart of the classes 
and seeing where we currently are. I was, oh my gosh, I can't believe we are that far into this. It feels like this past summer was our first summer and, and it definitely was not. I want to go ahead and start with why ECU for, for me personally is I'm, I'm a three-time pirate. I love ECU. I love everything about um, the faculty in all of my degrees that I had. And so when it was time to look, um, you know, I did weigh my options of, you know, I, I obviously I work at a, at a college who also offers an EDD program, but it was the faculty, I'll be honest, that drew me back to ECU. I said, I know what I'm getting into. I know how wonderful it is. Um, Dr. Pocket and Dr. Lewis mentioned that your cohort is going to be your your rock. And I didn't believe them. I said, I have enough friends. Like, I'm, I don't know these people. And like the first week, I'm like, mm, that's cute, but no. When I say I talk to our cohort every single day, I literally mean we talk via um, group me every single day. Um, even when school's not in, like when we have like a winter break, like we're still talking like, hey, how are you doing? Have you defended yet? And how's it going? And we know everything about everyone. And, and so that is definitely um, a great support system. But to know it was my time, my kids are older. Uh, we have four kids. Our youngest is a sophomore. Um, so I was like, okay, you know, I'm at the time where I don't have to worry about, you know, bedtimes and, and giving baths and all the things that take up a lot of your time when, when you have littles. Um, although I'll say I had the support of my husband, but he also joined a, a, a doctoral program at the same time. And that's a wild ride to do at the same time. But um, it also helps because it's not like what I was said, hey, do you want to go out to dinner tonight? And me going, no, I have homework. Cause like, no, we, we both have homework tonight. We have to get done. But um, I was in a good place in, in my career. I was, you know, finally settled at UNC Charlotte. So like I said, having older kids and a husband who was really supportive and being really settled in my position and a lot of support, honestly, from my own supervisor at UNC Charlotte, who was really excited about me going into the program. She is um, all but dissertation. So she was, when we talked about it, she said, yes, I'm going to, you know, definitely back you on this, but you have to promise you're not going to quit. And there were definitely some times over this past two years that I have had my own emergencies. And at one point this fall, I think Dr. Lewis and Dr. Pocky both knew I'm like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like, there's too much going on. And it was definitely my faculty and my cohort who definitely said, we've come too far. Let's figure this out. And I am, I can't imagine have, having quit at this point. Like, this has been probably the most rewarding experience of my life and and I can't say enough good things about ECU in this specific program. That's enough of me getting really nice to you guys right now. And I'll I'll take that A later on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh something I'm glad you touched on, Christy, was the support of our supervisor. One of the things that um we have found through experience that is just so critical is having the support of your supervisor. Now We've had students who've come through who did not have the support of their supervisor. We helped them through, right? Christy has a few, you know, cohort mates who experienced that. We'll help you figure a way out. It does make it much more challenging. And so having that conversation with your workplace supervisor, I'm considering applying, you know, are you going to support me? Because if you're addressing a problem or practice in your workplace, ideally we need to have the support of that workplace supervisor. If that support isn't there, then that's when it falls on us to kind of brainstorm with you and we come up with some really crazy wacky solutions sometimes but um you know we make it work and so um if you don't have that support maybe that's why you're pursuing your edd is to get out from uh <laughs> that really tough supervisor uh we understand we've been there so um anyway thank you christy very kind of joel if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your your experience all right so uh my experience has been very interesting. Um, so I first came into it, uh, first year principal, and decided that I was going to jump into a EDD program. Probably was not, uh, you know, hindsight 2020. I don't know if I would have did that, um, but you know, but it's been good. Uh, you know, within your first couple of years, you're trying to juggle. So I know that once I finished, you know, the rest of it would be cake. Um, trying to do a dissertation, learn the job, and also doing all the DSLPs. Um, but ECU, why did I choose ECU? Um, so 
I kind of took a different route. I started at Elizabeth City State um, for undergrad, also for my master's in mathematics. Then I went to George Washington for EDS. And then uh, most of what you hear through Northeast North Carolina is ECU. And so then I was like, OK, let me take a look at it. And actually, my superintendent, he just graduated Dr. Cheeseman this past um, year from ECU. So he talked to me about it and just talked about the layout. Um, the layout was the part that kind of sold me um, because the dissertation part, I've done a thesis for a master's, but a dissertation part um, very much was something I was very nervous about um, because of sitting there and just thinking that you have a year or two years where you're just on your own on this island, just typing up hundreds of pages. It just seems very overbearing and I, um, I don't know if I can do that part. Um, but this part, to know that we were working on it each step of the way was the best part about it um, because I knew that throughout this whole time it would be structured and when we finish, I wouldn't be on my own. Um, of course, like life happens. Um, I had both my parents pass uh, within the time of being in this program. But throughout it, um, you know, the staff has been amazing, just making sure uh, that you stay on target that when you need the extra support, um, you know, they're there also with the cohort. Um, I have two that's in my district that work with me, but also the ones that don't work with me, um, providing me, um, you know, extra support, sending out if I need some research topics that they're already researching on, they're sending me information. Um, so it's that collaborative part there. And just, you know, everybody's working, everybody's busy, everybody has family, everybody has kids, everybody has issues. And so then they kind of keep everybody on target because um, you'll just see a random text message. Did you know that we got class today at 6 p.m.? And it's like 5.55 and you're like, OK, I need to hop on here. Let me get to the house right quick so I can hop on the computer. Um, so that, that that's my biggest part at ECU. Um, if I had any like just something to take away from um, this kind of interest meeting, uh, just knowing, you know, um, knowing that this is what you want to do um, because just like they said life is going to happen and if you are a procrastinator please try to you know beat that up before you get into the program um, because just like they said life does happen but if you're on target when life happens then it's not so hard to try to get back on the train but if you're way behind and then life happens it, 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 it's going to be rough um, but I will say I, I am very happy that I made this decision to come to ECU though. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Christy. I appreciate you guys sharing that. We're going to have a chance for any questions you all have uh, toward the end. We'll be able to ask that. Um, and so thank you both for sharing your experience. Uh, they've done a remarkable job. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, overcoming adversity, the things that come our way. Um, and, you know, our program since you know i came through has been looking out for our students supporting them treating us like the professionals the leaders that we already are in many of our instances and so um instead of it being this you know uh empty container and the professors are you know pouring the knowledge in instead we're collaborators right we come together and share knowledge and information learn from one another support each other um, and most all of our faculty have been in your shoes before and we try to remember what that was like for us and so that we can demonstrate the empathy that uh, uh, we would want demonstrated through the golden rule right um, and, and so i inevitably remember whenever uh you know students submit something late and and what they're going through and as i've gotten to know them I'm like you know what they got a lot on their plate i'm just glad it's here right and so now let's let's work together and give them some feedback because you know the same uh kind of grace was shown to me as i was coming through the program and as i was a, a professional coming up so that's what you're going to get in our program uh, that you may not get in other places the other thing joel touched on is you know having that dissertation embedded in the program and in the coursework throughout um, a couple of my close uh, colleagues um, uh, chose other programs for one reason or another and uh, they came back and said, you know, I really wish I had had taken another route, uh, specifically ECU, because 
they said, uh, actually, one of them did her internship with with me from her institution. She kind of worked with me in my faculty role, and she uh, came in and sat in on some of our early classes. I don't know if you remember that, Dr. Puckett or not, but she came and sat in on some of our early classes, and she said, wait a minute, you guys are talking about the dissertation on day one? I'm in my third year, and we've barely mentioned it, right? They were going to finish the coursework, and then you get to the dissertation. Well, that's how you finish, and you may hear, you know, I think Christy mentioned the term ABD earlier, right? All but dissertation. Um, part of the part of the justification why so many institutions move to that CPEB model is because life happens. Folks don't finish, and we were having higher and higher ABD numbers. We had folks who get through the coursework. Look, you've done that your whole life. We've all done that, right? We can get through schooling. The dissertation piece is a whole nother animal, and so getting through all the content and then being like left on your own, like Joel was saying, kind of on this island unto yourself, kind of you just got to figure it out and good luck. That doesn't cut it for us, right? Instead, we said, all right, the CPEB model really exemplifies a, a path forward for our students so that they can get the support they need along the way. So um, I will shift gears back to all right, the admissions process, right? Or say you, you've said, all right, this is something I definitely want to pursue this year or maybe not this year, maybe in a coming year. What does that look like? And so what are we looking for? And it's not so much that, um, you know, we're trying to rule people out, but to Joel's point, to Christy's point, you know, for you to be successful, these are some of the traits that we're looking for because we don't want you to get in the program and not be successful. That is the last thing we want. So someone with leadership potential and that leadership commitment, they're motivated, right? Um, not the procrastinator, like Joel was saying, if you're a procrastinator, wow, that's gonna, it's, you have to be ready. You've gotta be going um, because three years, it's a lot. Um, appropriate professional experience. So, you know, we look at uh, leadership experience, right? Have you supervised others? Have you been in a leadership capacity? Part of why that is is so that the course content is relevant. You can't go lead people in this dissertation and practice if you're not given the credentials, if you don't have the background, if you don't have, we like to call it actionable space. If you don't have the authority to make change, then how are you going to lead people in making a change, right? So that's part of why we have this expectation of, all right, we want you to have this appropriate professional experience. A lot of times that looks like leadership experience. At least three years is what we really prefer so that you can say, you know what? I've led, I know I have the credibility, uh, I have the support, um, and I'm, I have the authority to be able to make change. Uh, this professional purpose and goals that are aligned with us, if, if you don't believe in the importance of addressing equity and social justice and issues of ethics, then we're not the right fit for you, right? Because you're going to get sick of us talking about how important it is to uh, create a learning environment where everyone and anyone can learn and be successful, right? That is what you're just going to hear it nonstop. We're going to promote that. That is what we're about. So we also expect uh applicants who are reflective and self-aware right so we want leaders who can stop what did i do well what did, what did i not do well how can i get better what did this experience mean how can i use it in practice moving forward how is it just meaning we don't want people who are just going to check the box and move on right i got my a i'm moving on that really doesn't create the kind of lifelong learning that we expect and want our leaders to model uh, effective communication, interpersonal skills, you know, just being able to, as we were mentioning, lead, right? You've got to be able to have the communication and interpersonal skills to be able to rally support, right? Uh, and uh, that's something we, we definitely expect. The collaborative skills that ties in with that. Professional demeanor, um, uh, just being able to conduct yourself in a way where you're able to garner that respect uh, so that people will follow you. You know, leading through service, service has to be something that you you care about, that you're passionate about, because not only is it ECU's motto, but uh, it's also when we talk about those district service leadership projects and pretty much every other assignment we have a bit along the way, it all comes back to service, service in this instance to uh, the students and, and staff that you work with. 
and I mentioned the equity piece. So uh, um, some of the information and Dr. Puckett, I'll let you um, uh, walk through some of these specific details, but uh, if you want to tell them about if they're if they're anticipating applying this year. And I wanted to mention one other thing really quickly that prior to admissions here. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out that I think is really unique that we offer um, to our students. We feel like it's really important for for our students to have a part in selecting who their chair is going to be. Right, so you are starting to work with your chair immediately when you start in the program and it needs to be sorry. My husband's texting me. It needs to be from downstairs. Um, it needs to be somebody that you really jive with, right? Like if you need somebody that's going to be emailing you and saying, hey, where are you? What's going on? Do you need me to text you? What's happening? I'll stay on you. Or if you need somebody that's just going to step back, you know, and let you do your thing and then that's fine. Um, but you actually have the opportunity to meet with the faculty and figure out who's going to be best for you um, because we want you to have the best experience and we want it to be somebody that that you really fit with that you can really be successful with um, so i think that's something that's really unique you're not assigned a chair um, you don't have to go out and find someone and ask them to be your chair we actually have an, we host the event dr lewis mentioned the poster gallery walk we host an event in the the fall of your first year for you to meet with the faculty, talk about your study and what you're hoping to do, and then you decide who you want to be your chair. So it's a really exciting event. Um, we always joke and say, Dr. Lewis calls it like, what is, which one do you call it? The voice? Like he calls voice. it like a voice, okay. yeah. you know, where you where you present and then and then who turns around can be your person. You know, I always say it rhyme. It reminds me of like sorority bid day, like where you write someone down and do they want you and do I want them? And yeah, so that was just what always came into my really, head. Really want us to invest in those big chairs that spin around, but whatever. we have the money right. for that. I'm very sorry. So no, and no I'm, I'm, chairs. I'm glad you, you mentioned that, Dr. Puckett, because, you know, it was uh, before we had a process like this where you had student agency to be able to select your chair. When I came through the program, it was figure it out for yourself, right? Fend for yourself, find someone. And so that was really advantageous for those who were a bit more privileged and had access and connections. And so we weren't really living up to that expectation when we talk about equity. So instead, how can we make it so that all students have kind of the same agency? And so that's a Dr. Puckett's example there is, is you know, kind of ideal how we, we try to model exactly what we're talking about uh, and giving you some um, some uh, control in that sense. And Thank especially, you. Especially because you may not have met all the faculty by the middle of your first semester, you know, or the first fall semester. You're not going to know who half of the folks are because you haven't had them for class yet. Um, so this is just a really good opportunity for you to really have some conversations with the other faculty members, see what their research interests are. Do they match up with what you want to do? And um, really have sort of start that relationship that that's going to be really important for you as you go through the program, because that's who's going to be helping you, um, supporting you, you know, making sure you're ready for your for your defense, um, all of that kind of good stuff, reading your your copies over and over and over again, um, which which I enjoy for some reason anyway. Um, OK, so admissions, um, admissions information, entry term we mentioned second summer semester application deadline. Very important. You need to have your online application plus all the required materials into us or into the graduate school by March 15th. So if you are interested in the cohort that's going to start this upcoming summer um, in in June 2023, then you need to have all of your materials in by March 15th. Um, so that the faculty can begin considering um, and looking at, at applications. Um, Dr. Lewis mentioned these other next two um, items about um, we prefer that you have leadership experience. Um, part of what we're trying to do in this program is help you in advance in your administrative opportunities um, and help you figure out those those skills that maybe you haven't used yet. Um, we're trying to build on what you already have, and so it's difficult for us to to help you kind of do that if you haven't been in that type of situation quite yet. So that's why we ask for the minimum of three years of experience. And then um, the K-12 concentration folks, 
need the um, administrator or, or principal license in order to qualify for the superintendent license. And then Dr. Lewis, do you want to mention about the numbers? Sure. And uh, first, back to the the where we say that you must hold the North Carolina Professional Educators License. If that's something that you're on the K-12 side and you don't have, we have a program for you for that, right? In our uh, Masters of School Administration program. And so we can provide you a little bit of history there and some, some information about that. I actually had to backtrack, right? Uh, the path that I was on early in my career, uh, I had to go and get a second master's and that seemed just so ridiculous. I had to go and get another master's. Why have I got to go back? I have one in counseling at that point. Why do I have to go back and get one in school administration? I'm so thankful I did just to have the background, the content knowledge and the credibility to be able to help me to move forward. If uh, some program that was just looking at getting uh, people into EDD programs because they wanted their tuition dollars and to move on, um, you know, programs were out there that could do that. ECU said no, like it, the integrity of our program is important. Uh, and so they made me backtrack and I'm so thankful that they did. So if that's something that you want to discuss, we'll hang back afterwards and can talk through that path for you. Now the, the cohort piece, um, we're going to be able, usually we, we try to create cohorts of about 10 to 12 students. Uh, and so we'll have two cohorts of higher ed uh, students this coming year. So we're probably looking at somewhere between 20 to 24 higher ed students that we'll be able to take. On the K-12 side, it's going to be a bit tighter. We're going to have space for one cohort. And so we're talking about 10, 12, maybe 14 students that we're going to be able to admit. So it's going to be much more competitive on the K-12 side this year than uh, typical when on, on average, we usually have two cohorts per concentration. So part of that is just, you know, our, our faculty load at this point, and we've got some, you know, folks who've retired and that sort of thing. And so as we're filling these positions, we don't want to take you into a program where, you know, we're not going to be able to, to provide you with the level of support and the, the standard of uh, that we have set for ourselves. So if you're on the K-12 side and you're thinking, oh, wow, they're only going to be taking, you know, maybe 10 to 14, that EDS to ED option is something that you might want to revisit because we do have plenty of space in our EDS to EDD pathway. So just something to uh, for you to consider there. Dr. Puckett, back to you. It was like a news show for a minute there. Um, the um, So actual materials that you will be submitting. So your online application, if you haven't done that yet, that's on the grad school website. So scurry over there and submit that for us so that we know that, that you're interested and in working on submitting your materials. The good thing is after you've submitted that application, then you can keep track of what's come in or what you're still waiting on. Um, that way you can check, have all my transcripts come in. I don't know, they were coming in the mail. Um, you can check about recommendation letters. Who do I need to hassle again that hasn't actually submitted their letter quite yet? Um, nicely hassle. Um, so online application, submit the application, be online as well. Official transcripts from every institution you've attended. So Christy only had the one because she had all of hers from one place. Joel had to get us a couple that, you know, from different locations and have them sent in. So um, and actually, if you did attend ECU, you're not required to um, order that transcript. It will just automatically be sent over electronically. So that's kind of a bonus that you don't have to do that. Um, statement of interest. Tell us why you're interested in the program, what you hope to get out of it, what your professional goals are. Um, this does not have to be a giant tell us your life kind of thing. Just kind of give us an idea of what, you know, why this is the program for you and why you think you're, you're, most interested. Um, if you're a K-12 applicant, you'll upload a copy of your license so that we know that that's current. You will also, both concentrations will submit the rest of these materials. So your resume, so, um, submit an up, a current resume for us, let us know your background and that sort of thing. There's a writing prompt that's located on the um, EDD website. Um, it asks you to respond to obviously the prompt that's on there um, having to do with educational equity and social justice. Um, I believe it also asks you sort of about that those kinds of topics in your current setting. 
So keeping in mind that maybe this is something that if I get into this program, I want to explore in my dissertation that I'm really interested in. Um, it also asks for you to, to include at least three um, uh, sources. So three sources in there. So this is your first sort of foray into the academic writing world. If you haven't done that in quite a bit, um, if it's been a little bit for you, that's that's what you want to do there. And then three recommendation letters. Um, typically, we will ask you at least one of those to be from your current supervisor. That way we know that they are going to be supportive. Um, you've had that conversation with them and you've you've asked them, this is what I'm looking to do. Or, you know, will you help me as I go through this program? Will you support me? So have those have those conversations. It's really important. Now, Dr. Puckett, do I do all of this and it just sits there and no one actually ever really looks at it? No, no. <laughs> no, no, we all no, read no. that. <laughs> I doing? spend lots and lots of time actually on the website, mm -hmm. pulling all of your materials and reading everything. And so following um, the March 15th deadline, faculty will begin review of the materials that have been submitted. So the complete applications. So they will get the applications. They will start reviewing um, at that point in time. Then we will contact individuals for um, an interview. OK, so the interview process for us is a little different. Um, it's different than what Joel and, and Christy actually got to do as well a little bit. Um, so we do interviews that are in person um, on campus. So we do require you to come to campus for that, for, for the interviews. It takes about three and a half hours to do these interviews, and they are group interviews. So you will be interviewing with some other folks that may be in your cohort with you. Um, it's a good opportunity, if nothing else, for you to network with some folks in, in your community, um, you know, your work community maybe. Um, but they really are fun. It's a, I, like nobody else, like who else is going to say it's an interview, but it's really fun, but it really is. So it's, you, not, it's not arm wrestling. It's not Thunderdome, no, right? No. Like it's it's your yeah, yeah, you, you each yeah, go no. have a moment to shine. Yeah, yeah, it's intentional and and it's and it's a good time. Um, it's nothing like what you think it's going to be. We're not going to put you in front of a panel who's going to ask you 500 questions and, you know, just you sitting at the front. It's not like that at all. So um, like we said, applications, get your applications in March 15th. That means all the materials by March 15th. Um, so make sure that you're checking up on your transcripts and all that sort of thing. Um, we will let you know late March, early April. Um, actually, we will let you know late-ish March um, because we're going to have a round of interviews um, the last week in March, and then we'll have um, some other interviews the first week in April. So that's when you know the interviews will be held. Faculty will get back together, look over all of the materials plus the interview information, and then when we make decisions, we'll reach out to people um, to offer seats in in the upcoming program. And Dr. Dr. Puckett goes out of her way to make sure that you have uh, a, a a variety of different times to be able to select from. So if evenings are better for you, there's going to be some interview dates where that's an option afternoon, morning. So you'll have some variety there as well, depending on what's best for for you and your schedule. Yeah, because we are asking a lot of you, you know, to to come to to campus for three and a half hours and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we try to make it as easy uh, for you as possible for you to to be able to fit that in your schedule. And Dr. there's our contact information. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lewis mentioned that um, we have the document that has all of the courses listed and the descriptions of the courses and that sort of thing. If you're interested in that and I haven't sent it to you yet, um, a lot of you I probably have sent it already. Um, send me an email and let me know and I can forward that to you. I can also forward you um, the PowerPoint that we've used tonight so you can look through that um, and have the slides again if you want to reference that. So just send me an email there either at that email address or the edd at ecu.edu email address also works. 